Thank you, Professor Abe, very much for the kind and fram friendly introduction of me as this evening's speaker. Partly uh, it is undeserved, but thank you very much for that. First of all, but I have to thank quite a lot for being here in Kyoto at all, in this really lovely country, and to thank for the honor to be invited for doing research at your famous and excellent University Kyodai, as I learned it uh, in the meantime. And especially thanks to Dean Professor Tomida, who is uh, absent today, of course, he got no time, and to Professor Abe again, who had the idea for that generous invitation. And also to the graduate school and faculty as a whole for the great hospitality and support in realizing this Kenkyo Taizai. Makotoni arigato gozaimashita. Then I wish to express heartfelt thanks to Professor Fujita for offering me such a nice occasion for a philosophical talk in her general scientific seminar or kind of uh, Studium Generale, as we call it, with her organizing and es episcopal surveillance. And of course, I thank you all for coming and your interest into some piece of philosophical thinking which I will try to explain to you. I'm very happy to take the opportunity and to tell you about the greatest Western philosopher's ideas on the nature of the human soul. They wisely clothed their ideas into pictures or allegories, like Plato and Aristotle did, when they spoke of the soul, as you saw it, as a winged chariot or as like a hand. Well, um, I let's get started with uh, the lecture. There are two handouts which I have prepared with the help of Professor Arbes, one in English and the other, I think, in Japanese and German, if you uh, want some support for uh, following uh, the English okay. lecture, you can uh, look onto these handouts. Every human has a soul. The soul connects us with all things because we can experience, feel and think about them. However, it also separates us from them and from one another because your way of seeing and hearing and feeling is not already my way of seeing and hearing and feeling. And because what we see is not the seeing itself, everyone represents through her soul another place where the world gathers together. The soul has always, in all parts of the world, been a not fully explained enigmatic object of thought, in Japan and Asia as well as in Europe and the West. Until today, we don't know what the soul really is, and probably we will never know it. We can only experience it, as long as we enjoy ourselves in having a soul. Instead of scientific theories, the great philosophers and thinkers have developed meaningful allegories of what the soul is. In my talk, I want to explain two famous allegories of the soul, namely those allegories that were coined by Plato and Aristotle, the two ancient philosophers at the beginning of the European history of ideas. Plato speaks of a chariot of, a soul, of the soul, chariot, a winged triad consisting of divergent yet combined powers, which can hardly be steered and which is nevertheless the only vehicle that brings us forward. Aristotle, who was poetically less gifted than Plato, laconically compares the soul with the hand, with the organ that leads us grasping something, although we cannot grasp this grasping organ itself. 
through their allegories, both philosophers, Plato as well as Aristotle, developed fundamental concepts of the European history of ideas and science, which even built on each other. Plato's chariot of the soul leads to the concept of a source power, Greek dynamis, a source power that surges into movement from itself. And Aristotle's hand leads to the concept of activity in Greek energeia, the modern word energy stems from there, concept of activity or operation in Latin in contrast to mere movement. But let us see on our own how the philosophers invented their allegories and how they presented them. I begin with Plato, with a winged chariot. The Platonic picture stems, as you all know, from the dialogue Phaedrus. There Plato describes philosophy, philosophy as a kind of erotic mania by which a human is pushed or rather shocked and moved by beauty and displaced from the enclosure of the common world view and, as it were, a little bit disturbed, by which turbulence she or he can use the impetus of beauty in order to face the ideas anew as the true realities that determine the world. These ideas, as Plato explains in his dialogue Phaedrus, these ideas were seen by every human soul before her birth into a body, more or less distinctly. Whereas in post-natal life, what we call our life, wa uh, everybody was, as it were, thrown off the track within the confusion of bodily appearances and those common views. But again, being disturbed by the erotic mania, this same soul, according to Plato, suddenly sees the things in another way and has a chance to rediscover the track of ideas. In addition, according to Plato, the erotic maniac is inspired by the relationship with his beloved human friend to take truth into account in a firmer and clearer way and to communicate it with the beloved who, in turn, being grateful because of this, enhances the incentive and the wings so that the couple regains the memory of the ideas together more and more intensively. In this way, an erotic spiral, so to speak, enhances the seal of the lovers towards the ideas and lets them grow strong feathers for the intellectual flight of philosophy. These feathers that allow the flight from the sensibly given back to the ideas are taken out of the allegory of the soul as a feathered or winged chariot. Now I will give the quote in its whole context, which you find on your handout as a quote of Plato. Plato writes, About the idea of the soul, we must speak in the following manner. To tell what it really is would be a matter for utterly superhuman and long discourse. But it is within human power to describe it briefly in a figure. Let us therefore speak in this way. We will liken the soul to the composite power of a pair of winged horses and a charioteer. Now, the horses and charioteers of the gods are all good and of good descent. But those of other races are mixed. And first, the charioteer of the human soul drives a pair, 
And secondly, one of the horses is noble and of noble breed, but the other quite the opposite in breed and character. Therefore, in our case, the driving is necessarily difficult and troublesome. End of quote. Also, the idea of the soul is an explicitly intended topic of this text. It is not specified. The idea is not specified. Instead, Plato describes it, as he writes, in a figure. It is, that is, in a mere picture or simile. According to Plato, pictures are all things that we see and are able to perceive in general. However, a picture is never the thing itself that is depicted in the picture by a certain similarity. There are many equalities and similarities of a thing. Many pictures, but only one single item is the thing itself. There are visible images, acoustic images, images in the sand, wall pictures, shadow images, even thermal images, neuro images, and so forth. The thing itself, however, is, according to Plato, never something visible or perceivable, but rather, as we all know, an idea according to which we must think if we want to properly understand an image that we see. All things, the whole world of perception, tahora ta, the visible things in Greek, are, according to Plato, mere images. The whole world of perception are mere images. That is, they don't stand for themselves, but at best direct our understanding towards the things in themselves that manifest themselves within the images through a certain similarity and which we cannot see nor perceive but only think. If we grasp them properly by thinking, if we predicate correctly what something is that we see or perceive, then we grasp the idea of the relevant thing and state of facts that we cannot in turn see, like the images, but must think. To think means to formulate or to articulate something by one's own effort, in a way that the articulated thought is possibly true or appropriate. Thinking is the skill to formulate, not only verbally, but also, for example, mathematically, musically, or creatively. What we see with our eyes is not yet the truth. It cannot be the truth, but is an image. In order to recognize the truth of a, th of a thing, we need to think of it in terms of its idea. However, thinking always demands from us an own performance of our soul, while seeing and perceiving take place, as it were, even in one's sleep. For to be sure, also dreaming is a kind of perception, however, not the act of formulating and not of thinking. We dream without own assistance, without own performance. The soul seems to be something that must perceive all images and, if at all, must think all things that are present in them by resorting to the right ideas. But it is also true that the soul itself can neither be an image that is perceivable nor an idea that one needs to think the soul itself is not something, but always exists towards something, or in relationship with something, or as an intention directed to something. The common platonic separation between the things of perception, that are images, and the ideas to which one refers by thinking, 
this common platonic separation breaks down in terms of the soul, which doesn't belong to any of both areas, neither the sensible tahorata nor the intelligible, but refers to both and mediates between them as it flew, as a winged chariot. Hence, it is not surprising that Plato doesn't present an idea of the soul, but in turn an image that is not the soul, but merely resembles it in a certain way. Thus, we must not think that Plato conceived of the soul as a kind of winged chariot. For a winged chariot would be something. However, the soul is not something, but stretches out towards something. The comparison that Plato draws concerns upon closer examination not the winged chariot, but the composite power of such a chariot. If you read the text again, it is not the winged chariot which is compared, but the composite power of such a chariot. A power, the Greek word for that is dynamis. The power, however, is not a chariot, but something that makes it drive. Power means to gain speed. Hence, Plato doesn't compare the soul with a vehicle, but with a composite dynamis of such a vehicle, namely with a power to drive that is fed by several possibly divergent tendencies. The dynamis, again, is not a thing, neither image nor idea, but is, as Plato explained very often and very clearly at many points in his work, is a relationship towards a tendency to a capacity to do things. And indeed, perceiving and thinking both activities of the soul are more similar to an orienting relationship towards things than to such a thing itself. Furthermore, it is important to remark that the relationship of the soul or the power of the soul is, as Plato more than clearly stresses, not a simple relationship or simple power. Rather, the dynamis is a multifaceted one, as composite power of a winged chariot and the charioteer. That is, it is a triply fed power, and at the same time tripartite rel relationship. And we all know how complicated such triangle relationships can be. And Plato as well, to be sure. Plato doesn't give the picture of three souls within each single chest, but of a tripartite soul within each chest, as he explicitly does in his Politeia or Republic. There we find the well-known parts of the soul that are unified in each composite power to which the soul is most similar. The three form X aspects are the desirous part, to epitumeticon Greek, the spirited part, to tumor edes, and the reasoning part, to logisticon. The desirous part, alas, could be of such noble and good descent as it is with God, but is, in terms of human beings, such a black and restive horse. However, Plato doesn't mean that we should untie this horse from the chariot. Rather, we need to tame it and integrate the composite power of our soul in a way that it acts toward a unified and hopefully the right direction together. For without di desire, without dissatisfaction, for instance, with a status quo, without the need of more than the senses provide us at the moment, man would never take a step. It is only desire that urges us to leave the cave of self-sufficiency. But then, urged in that way, where shall we go? The desire says, towards more and more of this and that, but the charioteer shouts, I calculate in advance that this will never satisfy the desire, but rather confuse 
the chariot in pain and disruption. But the black horse doesn't mind the shouting of the charioteer. We need a power to stand up to the black horse, which is the spirited horse, the second one, which justified indignation that obeys the instructions of the charioteer, although it must also follow the wrong direction. I don't want to describe this here in detail as Plato himself did in his Phaedrus and also in other parts of his work. The composite dynamis of the soul is tripartite and triply fed, and only because it unifies such three kinds, it is a capacity to reach out towards the good or better and to the cognition or correct understanding of the perceivable images. <coughs> I come to the second allegory, the Aristotelian one. As poetical and inspiring the allegory of the soul that Plato gives us seems to us, as prosaic and lapidary, Aristotle's comparison in the conclusion of his work on the soul appears to us. I quote Aristotle and his comparison. It follows that the soul is analogous to the hand, for as the hand is a tool of tools, so the mind is the form of forms and sense the form of sensible things. Full stop. End of quote. While we can immediately consent with Plato and let us carry away by the poetical and imaginative drive of the words, we initially, we initially don't understand at all what Aristotle wants to express with his somewhat awkward comparison, like a hand. Intellect, news in Greek, and perception, aesthesis, are, according to Aristotle, defining abilities or parts or pieces of the human soul. What, however, does it mean that our understanding is the form of forms, Greek eidos eidon, or that the hand is a tool of tools, organon, 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 Greek, and sense the form of sensible things, eidos eiteton. What does it mean? What we indeed can understand, more or less, is the term tool of tools. A primary tool is the hand with which we use all special tools by taking them in hand. But a form of forms? We seem to be unable to understand this in the same way. And likewise, we don't understand what Aristotle means by the form of sensible things which he identifies in the cited passage with the soul. But let us have a closer look at what a form actually is, according to Aristotle. What is a form, according to Aristotle? We easily tend, and firstly, tend to imagine something like outlines, silhouettes or schemata, sharply cut, contours that are, as it were, taken off from the things as they occur in matter and merged into the understanding. However, this is a complete misunderstanding of the Aristotelian concept of form. The form is not a pin-sharp outline of the thing, but it is an activity, Greek energeia, or operation, in which the concerning thing is entirely held together and comprehended. If, for instance, someone plays the piano or sings a song, then not his fingers act while flying over the keys, and not the vocal cords act as they vibrate in the throat. Rather, each single human as a whole is involved in the activity and comprehended by it in the commitment of this activity. The piano stool, the stage and the surrounding oxygen, however, don't belong to the activity of the play or the singing. Peculiarly, an activity involves and governs the acting subject 
or the individual as a whole and thereby separates it from its surroundings. And this is not only the case if someone plays the piano or sings, but according to Aristotle, we are, as long as we live, always engaged in activities, in activities thanks to which each of us and every living being is ever one and not, on the contrary, many things. The activity ori originates from or is maintained by the whole thing that is active and it leads to or benefits the whole thing that is active. Aristotle describes these relationships more precisely in his metaphysics, and I cannot go into details here. Hence, form, eidos, according to Aristotle, is the engaging activity or operation that holds the thing together and that is performed by it. Life, for example, and the behaviors of all living beings are such activities or in Greek, energeiai, that is, forms of the respective being that is active. In order to better understand Aristotle's concept of form, it is important to realize that Aristotle basically distinguishes two different types of agility or activity of a thing one of which applies to all forms of animated beings, while the other type of agility characterizes only those things that are moved. This is a difference between an activity that is internally perfected and thus self-preserving and self-continuing, the activity of life and all operations like singing and seeing and thinking, and an activity that is only a uh, spreading, but at the same time increasingly self-losing movement, like the movement, take it, of the wind or the water, which Aristotle characterizes as an imperfect activity for that reason. To this difference of activities or agilities, corresponds a difference of the forms, the self-preserving and self-accomplished form of animated beings versus, on the other hand, the self-losing forms of merely moved things against each, against each other. For each movement continues from one to the next and the following and nowhere establishes itself as perfect or stable activities of the first kind that remain with themselves and whose power is just the activity itself are in contrast animated activities or operations of a system that thereby remains identical and maintains itself and to whose form Aristotle refers as a soul. These real activities like seeing, speaking, thinking or metabolism and reproduction, not the self-losing activities, from form a branching and ramifying tree, these real activity form a branching and ramifying tree within each animated individual whose active root, according to Aristotle, can be called the form or the soul of the individual. In this way, we can better understand the above-cited conclusion from the work on the soul and allegory of the hand. The intellect is, as Aristotle said at this point, the form of forms, and sense is the form of sensible things. Intellect and sense are, in any case, activities and belong to the root of activity of the human soul. While perceiving something, we perceive that what is perceptible of it as a special datum, as a special datum in our sense activity. That is, we modulate this activity according to the patterns of the perceived object. 
for instance, a bright spot or a lightning modulates our already exercised activity of seeing. For it is not the case that the lightning initially switches on our perception. No, it is already going on. And now it goes in a slightly different way than without the lightning. Likewise in cases of hearing, smelling and so forth. In this way the sense activity always asserts itself as a form of the sense object. Likewise in case of thinking. We anyway operate in thoughts, for example symbolically, with symbols or words, and also with imaginations and thereby attempt to articulate or formulate certain facts as I have explained above. Formulating is a capacity of thinking and the formulation can be true or false under certain conditions. If it is true, then we have recognized the appropriate form of the thought object by means of our own formulation. Because of that the intellect is a form of forms, that is a formulating activity that is able to express particular forms that characterize something. Now we can also better understand the comparison with the hand as a tool of tools. According to Aristotle, a hand is not defined by its look, but is defined by its function, Greek ergon. The function that it performs by means of his hand-using activity of a human. Only this performing or acting hand is part of a human, says Aristotle in his Metaphysics. According to Aristotle, the definition of the hand does not so much consist in its appearance or in its possession of five fingers, but in the functional exercise or the directed handling aptly speaking. It is also possible to, as it were, integrate other tools in the handling by means of which the function of the hand is enhanced or refined or enlarged. Then the handling of the tool is integrated in the handling of the hand itself so that it is, as it were, assimilated into man's activity. In this way the hand is always the tool of tools. Finally, we regard to this property, exercise of a function, the soul as a, ho as a whole can be compared with the hand. Like the hand integrates the handling of tools in its own handling, the soul integrates certain form features of the perceived or thought things in its or man's activity of perceiving or thinking in general. Thereby, and this is Aristotle's main point in the cited conclusion of the anima, the soul is, as it were, everything. He psyche daonta poses di panta, Greek. Because it re-articulates and reformulates the defining forms of the things in terms of its own activities. Now I come to the third section, a kind of comparison of the both allegories, Plato's allegory and Aristotle's allegory. Plato and Aristotle, as we can learn from the two allegories, have coined two related but also significantly different concepts of solution with regard to the essence of all human souls and all souls in general. Two concepts of solution whose basic content can be held until now with regard to a scientifically and physically informed worldview and defended with regard to our contemporary discussion of the body-mind problem. For Plato, the soul is a power that emerges from three different roots. A power to reach out towards the things that are either sensible or intelligible. In this role or function the soul is rather a complex dynamis 
that means relation with things, but not a thing itself. The concept which we use still today for that kind of one's soul's capacity to reach out towards the things of the external world is intentionality. Intentionality, indeed a concept which is indispensable in the whole contemporary body-mind debate. And this concept of intentionality in its meaning comes very close to the platonic elucidation of the essence of the soul. According to Aristotle, who of course was familiar with this opinion of his teacher, Plato, the soul is in contrast not only dynamis, that is, not only power or capacity to reach out, but such a power in its permanent actual exercise, as long as the animated being is alive. A power in permanent exercise, however, is actually performed activity, Greek energeia, or entelecheia. Aristotle just invented the words energeia and entelecheia. This is the word energeia. And here you have the, the energy and the ergon in the word, and the ergon is function. So it is being at work, being in function, what this word energia does mean. A power in permanent exercise, however, is actually performed activity. Greek word is energia or the other word entelecheia. Aristotle just invented the words energia and entelecheia in order to describe something for which Plato didn't have a verbal expression. These two new words, energia and entelecheia, denote the effort to reach out, neither in its latent and hence imperceptible static state as mere power, to which we refer as disposition today, nor in its consequences or impacts the effect of the use of power. For the effect or the impact of a use of power always consists in certain self-losing movements or changes. Someone shouts or, signed or sings so that the windows burst. This is Oskar Mazerat in Günther Grass' famous novel, <coughs> The Tin Drum. Or someone dances so that the floor vibrates. These are the effects of singing, bursting or vibrating. These are the effects of singing or dancing as activities. Of course, it would be possible to cite the vibration of the eardrum or the firing of neurons in the brain of another person as effects of singing and dancing. But again, the effect of a dynamis of a power is self-losing movement. But the dynamis itself is, apart from its effects, imperceptible, latent, only dormant power or disposition. So, Plato didn't have an expression for that which lies in between, between the effect, mere movement, self-losing movement, and its imperceptible origin, the capacity of, or the dynamis as such. It is only Aristotle who gives a name to the essence, the thing itself, the manifest actuality of the soul and of every animal, namely the name, energia or entelechia, literally being at work, being in activity or being in completion. According to Aristotle, the soul is a self-accomplishing reality of a certain complex body. And the self-accomplishing reality of such a body solely consists in activities that are linked to each other. Without soul, that is without activity, it is merely a big heap of decomposing molecules. And its decomposition is in turn merely a bulk of self-losing and diffusing movements. But with a soul, such a complex body, 
always consists in a self-accomplishing and self-linking activity. It is this activity that holds it together or makes it become the unity of an individual animal and not a heap of diffusing molecules. Hence, according to Aristotle, the soul is a trunk of rudimentary activity, a trunk of rudimentary activity in each single being on which fruit-bearing branches of activity are grafted. In that way, we see a musician successively grafting his musical fruits on the trunk of music, that is of hearing and at the same time playing in him. From an early age and bit by bit, we graft the most subtle activities of seeing, feeling, behaving, speaking, writing, calculating and so forth on the children's trunk of activity. However, for what we don't find a connection in an already existing trunk, trunk of activity, we can never teach this a child and a human in general. Our technique serves to make the contact with new branches of activity accessible to men. Here we can see again that if all technique is just a tool, the soul is like a hand, for the hand expresses the last connection to our self-activity. Self-activity, however, is, as long as we live, the soul of man and each animal. To be sure, the rational, that is, verbal or intelligent capacity of our self-activity to modulate distinguishes the human soul from the animal, however, not absolutely and not discontinuously. Even animals have rudimental verbal and cognitive dispositions of action. Why not, if we are, after all, essentially related with them? But animals are not able to have control over, that is to take in hand, the development and refining of their activities through generations, to use the Aristotelian allegory another time. Thereby, they, after all, essentially differ from humans. On the basis of a better understanding of the allegories of the soul in Plato and Aristotle, we have also gained insight into their respective theories on the essence of the soul. And we have recognized that the theories of the soul of both philosophers are deeply connected and built on each other. The older philosopher conceives of the soul as a complex dynamis a complex power that is at least fed by three roots, a capacity to reach out or to undertake movement towards something, be it sensible things, images, or intelligible things themselves, ideas. Aristotle, the younger philosopher, who builds on it, firstly finds the concepts that grasp and describe the phenomenon of reaching out on the way itself, and thus neither only at the imperceptible source point nor at the self-losing effect, namely real activity and ergeia or self-preserving accomplishment, Greek entelecheia. The soul in Plato versus the soul in Aristotle behaves like dynamis versus energia, being capable versus being at work. However, the seemingly small difference is very consequential for the whole philosophy of both and also for the whole history of philosophy which builds on these classics. For if the soul is a dynamis, as Plato thought, then it is only possible to grasp it in its presumed effects. And these effects are, according to Plato, movements. Movements, however, are only the inheritance of a soul and not the soul itself. That means that in the Platonic allegory, the soul remains unknown and incognito between the indiscernibleness of a hidden source of the movement on the one hand and the alienation in its offspring as the movements them themselves on the other hand. At this point, it is possible to say and many people are saying it these days, that strictly speaking, we don't have a soul. 
but that everything only consists in processes of movement, brain waves, firing of neurons, and so forth. In contrast, Aristotle succeeds in uncovering the soul from the incognito as itself, in finding words for its actual intermediate position between the indiscernibleness of the origin and the alienation through the effect, namely the words energia and entelechia, which Plato didn't have on hand. According to Aristotle, the soul is the inner self-preserving and self-continuing that is accomplished activity. According to Plato, the allegory of the soul, this accomplished activity remains hidden and can therefore be denied. In contrast, the Aristotelian allegory characterizes the soul in its manifest existence, which is internally completed activity, which we can call operation and call it until today operation in opposition to mere movement. Even today we know better than at the time of Aristotle that this makes a big difference. For our entire informatics and computer technique consists in the nature of programmed activity or operation that is composed of distinct steps. Steps in which the beginning and the end are defined and therefore contained in the operation itself. This is the definition of operation, that beginning and end is in the definition of these processes, these form of agility, while mere movement disappears in vagueness. The soul, according to Aristotle, is of that kind, an internally completed and accomplished engagement into operative activity, not mere movement. And by means of our soul, we transfer this mode of activity, this operativeness, if you want to say this way, we transfer this mode of activity to all techniques even computer technique. Only where this accomplishment finds its way into the world, something happens step by step by step, which means in the mode of operativeness or operative activity, not of mere movement. For that reason, speaking and thinking, for example, are such activities and not movements or processes. Activity by its internally closed nature has always an articulation in terms of definite steps, which in turn possess a beginning, an end and a center, or are defined by them. Because of that, a real activity remains in the system in which it is initiated. However, one could also see here a certain problem that comes along with the Aristotelian allegory of the soul like the hand, namely the danger to begin to confuse our soulfulness with what we have learned to dominate in technically operating steps, and as well as to employ for any purposes. The hand can be used in different ways, and it is the hand that can be used to destroy, but also to preserve and support something. In contrast, the platonic allegory of the speed-gaining chariot of the soul is enigmatic. The soul remains hidden. We only remain interested in what comes from it. However, we don't have it available like the hand. For that reason, we will perhaps proceed best with both allegories together. We employ the Aristotelian allegory where modern natural science begins to deny that there is something like a soul at all. With Aristotle we can learn to recognize and acknowledge the reality of the soul. On the other hand, we use the platonic allegory where the opinion spreads that every psychological and mental performance can be produced by technique and computers, as it is the case with humans. Here we can point to the hiddenness of the spiritual nucleus in humans and in all living beings in order to preserve the respect for their technical unavailability. Therefore, it seems to be the case that we can only have a journey of life that is appropriate to the soul and guided by it with Plato and Aristotle together. That is what I finally want to wish us all. Go Seijo, arigato gozaimashita. Thank you.